All right, we're going to pick it up now on the Life of Messiah, session 56, lesson 10, page 15 in your outline. And we're in the middle of page 15, the response of the Pharisees. So let's review where we were uh, last week. Uh, last week we uh, were in Jericho, and there a short little Jewish guy <laughs> wanted to climb a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus. So uh, Josh played that part for us here. And um, Zacchaeus climbed the sycamore tree, and uh, the result was salvation. He became a son of Abraham, a son of faith. Uh, this is the verse that Yeshua was referring to, Genesis 15, 6. Then he, speaking of Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And this is really one of the key verses of the Bible, because Paul picks this up and he says, hey, we're all saved the way Father Abraham was saved, by faith. That's the common denominator. We all, from uh, Adam on, were all saved by grace through faith, uh, plus nothing. So Abraham believed God. He trusted God, and that's what we do today as well. Uh, from uh, Jericho, Yeshua moved up the Jericho-Jerusalem road, with, of course, Jerusalem being his ultimate destination. However, before he got there, he uh, uh, stopped off at Bethany, and that's where he's been spending... Uh, his uh, evenings in Bethany and we saw him anointed at the uh, in the home of Simon the leper by Mary and uh, here's that picture of Bethany again in the late 1800s mid 1800s um, so we get a view of what Bethany may have looked like when Yeshua visited the place uh, uh, 2,000 years before things probably have not changed you know things have not changed from for in the Middle East in many ways, in many ways, things are still exactly the same. And then um, Yeshua started the uh, triumphal entry into uh, Jerusalem, and his first trek was over the Mount of Olives. So in the center of the picture here is the Mount of Olives. Of course, from this aerial view, it looks quite flat, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, you realize it's a lot steeper and higher when you're there. Uh, on the west side, uh, excuse me, east side of the Mount of Olives was Bethany, where he was staying. On the west side of the Mount of Olives is the temple and uh, the city of Jerusalem. And right in between them is Beit Fagi. And as he went along the uh, road, he came to Beit Fagi and he drafted a colt, the foal of a donkey, into the service of the king. And this little guy, who had never been ridden before, uh, never bucked. He knew the Messiah was on his back. He knew his creator was riding him, so he submitted. So even if the religious leaders don't know what's happening, the animals do. They're not do. as smart as a donkey. Say again? They're not as smart as a not donkey. Not as smart as a donkey. Many oh, times no. we're as dumb as sheep. Yes. <laughs> All right, so Yeshua began the uh, triumphal entry. And as he did, the masses came out proclaiming him and um, hailing him as the Messiah. And we saw this from two factors. One, the palm branches and the branches of other trees were being laid down. And that's a ceremony associated with the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles will be fulfilled by the institution of the kingdom. So by doing that, they're, they're saying, we're expecting you to set up the kingdom now. And they're also hailing him, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The great messianic greeting of Psalm 118.26. So in words and deeds, they are hailing him as the Messiah. This is the messianic person. So that's the response of the masses. Now we pick it up with the response of the Pharisees. So we're in the middle of page 15 in your outline, and this is uh, section 187, and we'll pick it up on the Luke account on page 178 of your, of your harmony. Page 178, that bar across the middle of the page there is the Luke account. Uh, Luke is unique in covering this uh, detail of the triumphal entry. So let's read verses 39 and 40. Everybody get there okay? Alright, verse 39. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. So the tremendous acclamation that Jesus is the Messiah. And you would think, with all this acclamation, that things might change. But the leaders still steadfastly refuse to uh, accept him as the Messiah. They, can, they continue to oppose him. See, the unpardonable sin has happened. 
back in um, in uh, Matthew chapter 12. The unpardonable sin, the rejection of his Messiahship was a, had occurred. The, the uh, judgment of that sin, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, was now inevitable. It could not be alleviated. It is an unpardonable sin. And so nothing changes here. Jerusalem will be destroyed. We'll see that in just a little bit. So in spite of the proclamation of the masses, Jesus proclaims judgment. Let's look at verses 41 through 44. Things have not changed. The, the, the judgment is unpardonable. When he approached, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the, thin, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Because you have rejected my Messiahship, Jerusalem is doomed. The temple is doomed. The sin is unpardonable. Do you understand now what I mean when I say the unpardonable sin? This is nothing that can be, that can be um, uh, committed today. And remember, the judgment of the unpardonable sin is over and done with. It's past history, 2,000 years past, okay? Uh, granted, the, um, the results of that judgment are still with us today. The temple is still leveled. But that judgment is over with. It was literally fulfilled in 70 AD. And we also see that all Jerusalem seemed to understand that something significant is happening. So he comes into the city itself in the Matthew account. We're now down at the bottom of the page in the left-hand column, verses 10 and 11. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the multitudes were saying, This is the prophet Yeshua from Nazareth of Galilee. So, he's coming into Jerusalem, and Jerusalem at this time of, of a year, Passover, uh, the population was swelled to approximately two million people. Many people estimate uh, the normal population of Jerusalem uh, was, was expanded at least four times to around two million people. So we have pilgrims from the Galilee, where he had conducted teaching tours. We have pilgrims from Judea, where he had conducted teaching tours. We've got pilgrims from Perea, where he had conducted teaching tours. We have pilgrims from the Diaspora, Rome and Turkey, and uh, wherever Jewish people were scattered. Um, in the first century. So there's, there's literally millions of Jews in Jerusalem and they're all hearing by word of mouth that this fellow is coming into the city. Who is this? This is Jesus of Nazareth. So the word is getting out. But there's still opposition from the religious leaders in verses 14 through 16. And notice it jumps from verse 11 to verse 14 because uh, verses uh, the uh, the uh, harmony put verses 10 and 11 back with the um, triumphal entry there. So they pulled the, I mean verses uh, 12 and 13 back uh, with the triumphal entry, I believe it was. All right, verse 14. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were crying out in the temple and saying, Hoshiana to the son of David, they became indignant and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read, Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes, thou hast prepared praise for thyself? So Jesus accepts the acclamation of the masses, from the kids to the adults, everybody. That shows that he is the Messianic person. He accepts that clear uh, statement that he is the Messiah. Now, go back to verse 40 in the Luke incident. Just go back up the page to verse 40 in the middle there. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. You see, on this day of all days, there must be an official testimony that the Messiah has come. And if mankind would not proclaim it, then nature would have proclaimed it. All right, to the uh, next page, page 179, at the top of the page is verse 17 in the left-hand column. 
And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. So he returns to Bethany after the triumphal entry. Alrighty, that brings us to the next page of your outline and we have a little application chart because of course we don't want this to simply be an intellectual exercise. We want to apply some of the lessons we've come across to our personal lives. So the theme I chose was the theme of the arrivals of the king. The arrivals of the king. And where did I get that theme? Out of the biblical data in our lesson. And so the uh, king arrived in the life of the rich young ruler, right? Mm -hmm. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Yeshua said, uh, sell everything, come follow me. So he rejected, he couldn't do that. He rejected the, uh, the Messiah. He rejected Yeshua. The uh, king arrived in the life of Zacchaeus. His response, he became a son of Abraham. Salvation and discipleship. He then wanted to move on from the salvation experience and return any money he had defrauded from people with a penalty. <coughs> so he's starting down the road of discipleship, of living out his faith. Uh, remember in Jericho, the blind beckers came to him and their response was a response of faith and they received physical healing. And now he comes to Jerusalem and the response in Jerusalem is mixed. Proclamation by many and rejection by many. So now we need to ask the personal questions. Has Jesus the King arrived in your life, in my life? What will be our response to him? Will we reject him or accept him? I trust everybody in this room has uh, accepted the king into their life and has, he's arrived, but if not, this is a little gentle evangelistic request. You know, consider him your king. Accept him into your life. If you have accepted him, will you go on to discipleship as Zacchaeus did? Live out your faith. Will you let him heal the hurts in your life, the physical hurts in your life, the way the blind beggars did? Will you proclaim him to friends and neighbors as the masses did, as the disciples did as well? So uh, under plan of action, perhaps there's something you could write down there if any of this strikes a chord in your life. Write down how you could make this application uh, part of your life. How could this become a real and personal part of your life? Just a sentence or two, just a word or two. And as I always do, if uh, anyone feels led to share uh, their application, their, their, their uh, plan of action, you know, feel free to slip your hand up. We'll give you a chance to share briefly. But again, this is personal. Yeah, G2, go ahead. When I become Christian and when I start reading the Bible, I took Bible as a, what it says. When Jesus says, this is the new commandment I gave you. You love one another. Mm -hmm. So I love and other people. There is some problem with the husband or the brother or sister. I said, you should love them. He said, you don't know what they did. I said, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't say this is a suggestion. This is a commandment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's moving on to discipleship. Making, right. making uh, uh, what you read and the commandment that you read part of your life. Okay. Well, Carolyn, I'm going to move on, okay, as we are tight on time. So thank you. Appreciate that. All righty. Let's go on to section 188. And uh, we're now on page 17. And section 188 deals with the cursing of the fig tree. Page 17 in your outline and page 179 in your harmony. About the middle of the page there. So here we're going to get a glimpse at the authority of the king. The date we're looking at is the, um, the, the 11th of Nisan. This is Monday, the 11th of Nisan, 30 AD. Next day. And so we come now to the cursing of the fig tree. And you know, uh, critics have used this little in, uh, incident to criticize the Bible and to criticize Jesus. Uh, they've got kind of asked the question, what right did Jesus have to curse the fig tree? You know? And this objection comes because of the time of year. It's spring. You know, Passover falls in the spring. 
And that means the ripe figs will not be available on that tree for six more weeks. And so um, the critics say, I mean, he had no reason to curse the fig tree. The poor thing couldn't put out figs anyway. You know, what's he demanding of that poor innocent little fig tree? So they say that Jesus is just being infantile. He's just being childish. All right, well, let's take a look at this and see exactly what's going on here. And I think we can answer that kind of objection very clearly. So we'll pick it up on the Mark account. The Mark account, verses 12 through 14. Mark 11, and that's the middle of the page. That's the right-hand column, the Mark account. So let's read verses 12 to the beginning, through the beginning of verse 14. And on the next day, when they had departed from Bethany, he became hungry. And seeing at a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he answered and said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. All right, the answer to this objection lies in the nature of the fig tree. Now, at the time when the uh, tree begins to put out its leaves, it does mean that the mature ripe figs themselves are about six weeks away. However, at the same time the leaves come forth, the tree produces edible, and I repeat edible, they're not, apparently they're not so delicious, but they're edible, little nodules that are a sign of the fig tree's fruit yet to come. Now, let me show you this. Here is a fig tree, and now you can get an idea of why the Bible says the ideal in the kingdom is every man will, ha will sit under his vine and his fig tree. Well, why would you want to sit under a fig tree? Look at that shade, huh? Nice and cool under that fig tree. Lots of shade because of the nice broad leaves. So there's a fig tree, and uh, here's a close-up of the leaves. You can see the leaves are nice and broad, and so there's plenty of shadow thrown on the ground. And there you can see some figs uh, protruding from the branches. Now let's go to when the leaves begin. Now here is uh, this early, early spring where the leaves just start to form. And you can see the triangular shaped leaf uh, coming out on the left side. Well, what's, right, what's next to it on the right side? That's the little nodule that will eventually become a fig. So when the leaves come out, if the tree is going to be fruitful, the fruit starts as well. The nodules come out as well. And then they mature. And here you can see them beginning to mature, getting a little bigger, uh, still not quite ripe. And finally, after six weeks, there you have the mature fig. Okay? <laughs> For your fig Newton, right? All righty. Now, uh, this tree had the leaves, but it didn't have the little nodules the beginning of the fruit. So it wasn't going to be fruitful. In other words, this tree is guilty of false advertising. <laughs> My leaves are out, and that should signal that the fruit is starting, but I have no fruit, okay? So it's making a profession it did not have. This tree is a hypocrite. It's making a profession it did not have. It is not going to be fruitful, even though it looks like it will, and so it is cursed. Now what happened to the fig tree is parallel to the nation. This nation, with the triumphal entry, is making a profession it did not have. They're proclaiming Jesus the Messiah, and yet they're not going to accept him as the Messiah. So it's a profession they did not have. And so the generation, this generation of Jewish people, is going to be cursed for rejecting his Messiahship. And I think Jesus chose the fig tree because it symbolizes Israel in, a, in three sections of Scripture at least. Jeremiah 24, verses 2 through 5. Uh, the chapter begins, One basket had very good figs, like first ripe figs. And the other basket had very bad figs, which could not be eaten due to rottenness. Then the Lord said to me, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good ones, very good. And the bad ones, very bad, which cannot be eaten due to rottenness. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Like these good figs, so I will regard as good the captives of Judah, 
whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans. So here we see the, the uh, faithful Jewish people that went into captive in, into captivity of, of Judah, nevertheless, they're likened to these good figs compared to this fig tree. Then in Hosea 9.10, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. Well, there's another agricultural metaphor for Israel, grapes. I saw your forefathers as the earliest fruit of the fig tree in its first season. But they came to Baal Peor and devoted themselves to shame, and they became as detestable as that which they love. And so the forefathers had all the potential of this early fruit in its first season, but it went bad. It went bad. So again, the people of Israel compared to the fig tree, to the fruit of the fig tree. And finally, Isaiah 28, 3 and 4. The proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim are, is trodden underfoot, and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is at the head of the fertile valley, will be like what? It will be like the first ripe fig prior to summer, which one sees, and as soon as it is in his hand, he swallows it. So here, the first ripe fig is a picture of judgment, and Ephraim is the subject of judgment. So when you see that first ripe frig prior to summer, that's exactly what Jesus is looking for here. You know, you snatch it up and eat it. Well, that's what will happen to Ephraim. So again, here's a picture of the largest tribe in Israel compared to the fig tree or figs. So I think that's the reason why he chooses this picture. What about the reference to uh, the budding of the fig tree, the generation that sees that, the That's a different idea. That's a whole different idea. We'll get to that later on, okay? Well, how do you figure? We will. Figure. <laughs> okay. All right. You got it. How do you figure? Thanks. Thanks, Roger. <laughs> okay, Carolyn. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So many of the masses would be inclined to accept him as Messiah, but it's the religious leaders who rejected him. So, isn't the greater percentage really wanting to accept him that they would if the religious leaders had? Or you see that it's not a no, no only a. Re issue. Yeah, only a remnant will accept him. The vast majority of the nation will follow the lead of the leaders. The vast majority will follow the leaders. Even, even today. Even today. Even back then? Yes, the even. That yep. yep. It's, a, it's a profession. It's a profession they did not have. It's a false profession. Okay? All righty. They like the fig tree. They're, it looks good, the leaves. You know, the profession is the leaves. But when you look a little deeper, there's no fruit there. That's what's going to happen. Yes, one more question. Do you think the disciples understood that concept? No. They didn't. Uh, uh, well, about the no nodules, you know, like it, it, it related. Okay, wait a second. Maybe as we finish up here, okay. maybe this will answer your question. Well, no, no, not necessarily. But let me, let me finish up and maybe your question will be answered, okay? <laughs> if not, ask it again or I'll comment on that. All righty. So the, uh, the nation is under a curse. It will be unfruitful for an age or dispensation. That would be a better way to look at the, uh, at the uh, Greek language there. The translation is a little strong. So the nation will be unfruitful for an age or a dispensation. Unfruitful until a future time. And we know the fruit will come at the end of the tribulation period when every living Jewish man, woman, and child finally places their faith in Yeshua those that are alive at the end of the tribulation. So our history is very consistent, isn't it? We are past and present and future history is really quite consistent. Now we also see here an intertwining of the Messiah's humanity and deity and that comes out in the Matthew account, the uh, left-hand column in section 188. First of all, verse 18. Now in the morning when he returned to the city, he became hungry. Well, he who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps or becomes hungry, right? So this focuses on his humanity. He's the God-man, fully God and fully man. He became hungry, just like he was tired at the well in Samaria. Verse 19, now we get a focus on his deity. And seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, no longer shall there ever be any fruit on you. So he has the authority to curse the fig tree. And this will reveal his deity. And then, in answer to uh, Cannon's question here, 
Let's take a look at the last part of verse 14. Mark 11, 14b, And his disciples were listening. They were paying attention to the lesson. So I have a feeling they were probably trying to pick up the best they could what he was talking about there. Okay? I really think they were trying. Trying hard. Okay, question. I'm a little bit annoyed with, him, with the word listening. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Like it's a sentient like human being. Well, you'll have to take it up with him. <laughs> Well, I would have to look at that in the text, but I have a feeling it might be in the neuter. See, Greek has a ma masculine, feminine, and neuter. It may very well be in the neuter. I don't know. I'd have to look it up. I'm not with it. Okay, well, if it's in the neuter, he's talking to something that is, you know, inanimate. Inanimate? Yeah. Well, then I can handle that. Okay. <laughs> well, well, we'll just assume that. Okay. <laughs> All right, lesson 10. Page 18. Turn to page 18. Now we come to section 189, and we come to the second cleansing of the temple. So this is the second event on Monday, his possession of the temple. And we'll start out with the Mark account. The Mark account is the middle column on the bottom of page 179. So let's read verses 15 through 17. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and began to cast out those who were buying and selling in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers, and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. Page 180, middle column, verse 17. And he began to teach and to say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a robber's den. All right. So the uh, manner in which Jesus began his ministry is the manner in which he brings his ministry to a close. He entered the temple compound on the first Passover of his ministry and he overthrew the money changers. And on the last Passover, he does the same thing. And here's that illustration I showed you way back when, when we uh, looked at the first Passover. Yeshua cleansing the temple of the bazaar of the sons of Annas. This was called the bazaar of the sons of Annas, and it was quite bizarre. Uh, so we'll look at what was going on there, especially for you folks that are new. We'll cover the problem. What was the problem here? Well, he sees two things in the court of the Gentiles. Now, what is the court of the Gentiles? Here is the uh, Temple Mount. Uh, the Herodian temple platform that you can visit today. That's the Herodian temple platform within the red bar there. Now inside the Herodian temple platform you see another uh, barrier. That signifies the Solomonic temple platform, the 500 cubit square platform that Solomon built for the temple, in the first, uh, for, for the first temple. Inside of that you see another barrier and that is the Soreg. That is the barrier that had the sign on it. Gentiles are not permitted beyond this fence upon pain of death. So anything outside the Soreg is considered the court of the Gentiles. The Gentiles can come in anywhere they want to the, to the limit of the Soreg. Now, exactly what was, where the bazaar of the sons of Annas was being held, we don't know. Uh, you can see the Herodian temple platform is surrounded by porticos. Probably in one of those porticos we have the, uh, the Bazaar of the Sons of Anna, something like that. Now here's another close-up of Herod's temple. And again, you can see that uh, soreg there on the inner edge, the limit of uh, Gentile participation uh, in the temple. It ended right there. So what was happening there? Well, we'll tell you about that after the break, okay? So go ahead and take your break and listen for the shofar, and we'll pick it up in about 15 minutes. In the uh, temple, we're examining the problem of the bazaar of the sons of Annas. So what was going on here? So basically, Jesus saw two things in the court of the Gentiles. 
And those two items that he saw were the sellers of sacrificial animals and the money changers. Now for those of you that are new, or old I should say, you've seen this material way back when, when we went through the first cleansing of the temple. So we'll, we're going to review it again for all those that have come since then. Okay? Now from Jewish sources we learn what was going on there. We learn that there was a corrupted priesthood in the Talmud, Maasei Pesachim 57a, Abba, Abba Shaul. Woe is me because of the house of Bothus. Now these houses are all priestly houses, priestly families. Woe is me because of their staves. Woe is me because of the house of Hanin. Woe is me because of their whispering. So here persecution is going on with um, clubs and with words. Uh, with um, uh, whisperings, what we call it here, uh, gossip probably, something like that. Woe is me because of the house of Kathros. Woe is me because of their pens. So here they were writing out some kind of legal documents that were causing problems. Woe is me because of the house of Ishmael, the son of Fabi. Woe is me because of their fists. So you see we had a corrupt priesthood in the temple. Uh, the um, Pharisees hated this bazaar of the sons of Annas as well, but the temple compound and all the functions of the temple were controlled by the Sadducees in those days. And the main Sadducee was the high priest Annas. And so this title, the rabbi's title for what was going on, the bazaar of the sons of Annas, is not a compliment. And Rabbi Shaul of Jerusalem uh, uh, talks about Annas and his family. Continuing on in Pesachim 57a, for they are high priests, and their sons are temple treasurers, and their sons-in-law are trustees, and their servants beat the people with staves. <coughs> now, uh, some 40 years later, Josephus would write about what was going on in the temple. And 40 years after the time of Messiah, the high priest was Ananias. He was the son of Annas that we read about in the New Testament. And so um, Josephus goes on to describe him in this method, this way. In Josephus Antiquities he says, But as for the high priest Ananias, he was a great hoarder up of money. He also had servants who were very wicked, who joined themselves to the boldest sort of the people. And he went to the thrashing floors, and they took away the tithes that belonged to the priests by violence. So the high priest's servants took away the priests, the tithes of the common priests, and did not refrain from beating such as would not give these tithes to them. Wow. Some of the other high priests acted in the like manner as did his servants, without anyone being able to prohibit him. So the high priestly families were extremely corrupt. So, so that some of the priests, that of old, were wont to be supported with these tithes, died for want of food. So even some of these common priests starved to death because they were so pillaged by the, the high priestly families. So nothing has changed. You know, nothing has changed from 30 A.D. to 70 A.D. From Yeshua's day to Josephus' day. The bazaar of the sons of Annas continued, and it was a sad, sad situation. All right, let's take a look at the two things that are happening here. Top of page 19. Two problems. First of all, the sellers of sacrifice. Now, according to the Mosaic Law, you needed to bring a lamb to the temple for the Passover sacrifice, and it had to be a, an unblemished lamb. So you had to have your lamb inspected by the priests, the high priest's family, so... In order to get your lamb inspected, what did you have to do? Pay a, an inspection fee. You had to pay an inspection fee. So that went to Annas. But guess what? What would happen to your lamb? Inevitably, it would fail. Something wrong with it. Oh, he's got a, he's got a missing eyelash. He's, uh, he's, he's uh, uh, blemished. Well, what was your options? Well, if you lived close by in Judea, perhaps you could go get another one. Of course, would there be any guarantee that that one would pass? No. But if you lived in Galilee, you couldn't get one. That's a three-day journey. You know, so what, what was your other option? Well, it just so happens that Annas had some 
some sheep with a good housekeeping sale of approval on them, you know? So come right over here and buy a sacrificial sheep from us. And of course the price was inflated because it was a quality approved sheep and so the money went into the pockets of Annas. And Ananias, who his son, his son was a hoarder up of money, he loved money. So that was the sellers of sacrifice. The second issue was the money changers. You had to pay your temple tax. Uh, this was a Jewish temple tax during Passover. But to do it, you had to use special coinage. And so there was a service charge for the exchange from your coins to the proper temple coinage. And of course, who oversaw that but Annas? And so more money went into his pockets. Now archaeology has corroborated uh, Josephus' statements by revealing the greedy compromising priesthood as well. And uh, by the way, these next few slides I gave to you way back in uh, lesson uh, three, but I made 25 or so extras. So if you want another copy to stick into your notebook at this point, we have some up there. And if they're gone, I'll bring some next week as well, if you want a second set. But uh, archaeology has revealed a compromising, greedy, brutal priesthood as well. These are the coins used for the temple tax. Now, what's wrong with these coins? Caesar. They have, well, it's not exactly Caesar, but they have images on them, right? We'll find out exactly whose image this is. Okay, and they have an image of, the, of an eagle and an image of a man on them. Now, this comes from the Biblical Archaeology Society. A puzzling practice took place at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem when the Jews went to Jerusalem Temple to pay their religious tax or make payment to redeem their firstborn sons. They paid with shekels like these. And, of course, they're referring to these shekels that I'm showing you. Minted in the Phoenician port city of Tyre, the coins of Tyre are covered with pagan symbols and text. On one side of the coins is the head of the god Melkart, a Phoenician god identified with Hercules. On the other side is an eagle surrounded by the text of Tyre, the holy and city of asylum. There you are. There's Melkart on the left side and the you can see the um, the uh, letters on the right side that spell out uh, Tyre the holy city. Now this is a Tyrrhenian shekel in the Davidson Center at the temple. It's a center uh, dedicated to the Temple Mount and the archaeology there. If you've been with me to Israel you saw this thing. It was you know it's about this big. It's a enlarged shekel and I took this picture because it shows the writing quite clearly there. Tyre, the holy city, with the eagle on it. So this is a, one side of a Tyrrhenian shekel. Jewish law, is, as found in the Pentateuch, prohibited the use of images, especially of a god. And Jews did not acknowledge any city except Jerusalem as holy. Yet among the laws compiled in the Mishnah, 2nd century CE, this means that this is a reference to when the Mishnah was written down. In the 1st century it was oral only, it was an oral form but in the second century it was written down. Among the laws compiled in the Mishnah is the requirement that payments to the temple were all to be paid according to the value of the shekels of the sanctuary in Tyrrhenian coinage. Early archaeological work uncovered the existence of this seemingly contradictory practice. On the one hand, Tyrrhenian shekels of the last centuries BCE and the first century CE turned up in excavations at many sites with their consistent pagan imprints. The Phoenician god on one side and Tyre the Holy on the reverse. On the other hand, it became evident that Jewish coins were also being minted during the Hasmonean and Herodian periods. Why would the temple priests not prefer to accept their own non-offending coinage? Why did they choose to use this coinage? Archaeological excavations in the Holy Land have turned up bronze coins minted by Jewish governments during the Hasmonean and Herodian periods, but not a single silver coin until the time of the first Jewish revolt in 66 CE. Evidently, from about 125 BCE till about 65 CE, 
The silver shekels of Tyre became the dominant currency in the Near Eastern countries, kind of like the U.S. dollar is today. Yaakov Meshur, chief curator of archaeology and curator of numismatics at the Israel Museum, believes this combination of the absence of Jewish silver coins and the international reputation of the Tyrian shekels may explain the otherwise puzzling decision uh, by temple authorities preserved in the Mishnah. In other words, the point is this. The Sadducean priests apparently required the payment of offensive coins because the coins were more valuable. Okay? Better coins, we're going to use pagan coins because they'll make us richer. So there it is again. Uh, these uh, these um, idolatrous coins were used in the temple by the Sadducean priests. Now here's an illustration uh, showing what was going on, uh, kind of an overview on the temple courts. In the background here we have those lambs that have the good Sadducean housekeeping seal of approval on their stamped on them. Approved lambs, you can buy these. Uh, such a deal I have for you. And down here we have doves for the poor. The poor would buy doves for their sacrifice. And here is this downtrodden, dirt poor uh, peasant woman bargaining with this priest to buy a dove. And this guy here is inspecting a dove to make sure it's uh, uh, unblemished. And to the front, what do we have in the front? Money changers. There's a guy dealing with the uh, Tyrrhenian shekels. And in the back, Roman soldiers, because the Romans carefully monitored the Temple Mount because vast uh, numbers of Jewish people would come up on the Temple Mount and it turned into a flashpoint uh, many times. So there's an illustration of what was going on there. And here is Yeshua again cleansing the Temple of the Bazaar of the Sons of Annas in one of the porticos there. He didn't have any tolerance for this practice. All right, let's pick up the Mark account. The Mark account, uh, verse 18. We're on page 180. We're finishing up this section. Page 180, center column, verse 18. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, for all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. So the rejection of his messiahship continues. When the priests learn of the cleansing of the temple, they immediately begin to plan how to get rid of him. They're afraid to do it. They're very cautious because of the masses. The masses are very enthused about Jesus at this point in time. And they're beginning to go over to Jesus instead of to them. So there's a lot of uh, turmoil going on. Judas will give them the opportunity that they seek. All right, section 190, we're now on page 20 of your outline. Request of some Greeks and the necess necessity of the Son of Man's being lifted up. And John covers this, unique section of John. Now this is the third event on Monday. This is the 11th of Nisan still, the third event that is recorded. And let's read verses 20 through 22 of the John account. So middle of page 180, verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These therefore came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and they told Jesus. All right. So these, uh, this question is raised by these Greeks. They come and ask, can we see Jesus? Can we meet with him? Now these Greeks are probably Gentile converts to Judaism. They've probably um, been influenced by the synagogue in Turkey or uh, in Greece or in Rome, wherever they came from. So apparently they're converts to Judaism coming uh, to the temple for the Passover. So they come to Philip, and probably because Philip has a Greek name. That's probably the reason why they singled him out. Philip asks Andrew, and they come to Jesus, and they ask the implied question, will you receive these Gentiles? And Jesus will answer them uh, in summary here, no. 
Gentiles cannot come to me at this time. That's the implied response, and we're going to dig into that response. Why did he say this? Well, Jesus will now spell, spell out his death and resurrection program so they will know exactly why these Gentiles must wait a short time longer. That's a four-part answer. So well, let's pick it up in verses 23 and 24. We'll, we'll summarize that answer quickly, and then we'll go back and cover the sections of the scripture we skip over. So part one of his answer is verses 23 and 24. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. If it dies, it bears much fruit. So by his death, he is going to produce life. He is going to be like a grain of wheat. So that has to happen first. He has to uh, go through the death and resurrection experience. Now drop down or drop over to the next page, page 181, top of the page, and pick it up on verse 31. The second part of his answer, first part of verse 31. Now judgment is upon this world. So by his death, he's going to judge the world. The next part of his answer is the second part of that verse. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. So by his death, he's going to defeat Satan. This, all this has to happen first. And then verses 32 and 33. And when I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. So by his death, he will draw all men to himself. So right now, these, these uh, Gentiles have to wait just a little bit longer and then the door will be opened, the gospel door will be opened to the Gentiles. So after the crucifixion, then they can freely come to him. So this is basically the answer to the Greek proselytes' questions. The Gentiles are not free to come to Jesus at this time. Now the gospel door will be opened to the Gentiles by Peter in Acts 9, 10, and 11. That's when the gospel door is opened with the, the experience of Cornelius. From that time on, the Gentiles are free to come to Jesus without any uh, intermediary, without any barrier. But it's after his lifting up will occur. And notice he uses the term lifting up there. It's a reference to how he will die, and throughout his entire ministry, he knew exactly what was going to happen. Uh, so this is a reference back to, for example, John 8, 28. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And I do nothing of my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. So he understands in the middle of his ministry that he's going to be lifted up in crucifixion. Back at the beginning of his ministry, three years earlier, John chapter 3, verse 14, he tells Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Again, another reference to his crucifixion. And that goes back to Numbers 21.9. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it up on a standard. He lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked on the bronze serpent, he lived. So Yeshua is very, very aware of exactly what is going to happen to him. He's been aware of it uh, his whole life. Now at this point, Jesus issues an invitation. And this is the first of two invitations. So go back, go to the top of uh, page 21 in your outline, and go back to John 12, verse 25. And we'll pick up that section we jumped over. John 12, 25, and 26. He who loves his life loses it, but he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So in verses uh, 25 and 26, he issues an invitation to salvation. It's an individual in invitation. 
uh, inviting people to come and trust in him. And then he prays. Then he turns to prayer. He's troubled. He knows exactly what's bearing down upon him. And yet, look at the all-consuming passion of his soul. Verses 27 and 28. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So his all-consuming passion is not what's going to happen to him and the uh, agony he's going to go through, but the glorification of the Father. And in verse 28 comes an instant prayer response. Don't you wish your prayers were answered like this? Father, glorify thy name. Then there came therefore a voice out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Boy, I would like that. <laughs> I would like that. <laughs> Lord, show me a parking spot. Right over there, Bob. <laughs> Sometimes it happens, although not with a voice from heaven. All right, so this audible voice from heaven has now come a third time in the ministry of Yeshua. Remember, first time was at his baptism when he was immersed. The second time was at the transfiguration. And now we have the third audible uh, voice. But the multitude is quite confused by what they hear. I don't know exactly what they heard, but we get a hint that they uh, didn't clearly hear the words. Verse 29. The multitude, therefore, who stood by and heard it were saying that it, that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. So they were kind of taken aback by all this and didn't quite understand what was going on. Now, in response to their confusion, Yeshua extends a second invitation. And the invitation is to walk and accept the light while it is still here. Verses 30 through 33. We looked at that earlier. Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this, of this world shall be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death that he was to die. So there's, uh, there's his invitation, come to me, because I'm going to, judgment is coming upon this world. Uh, then, in uh, verses 34 through 36, we see that sub-theme of the conflict between light and darkness that is so much part of John's, uh, John's gospel. The, multiple, the multitude therefore answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Messiah is to remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus therefore said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, that darkness may not overtake ye, you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, in order that you may become sons of the light. So there's the explicit invitation right there. Another invitation to trust in him. He is the light of the world. But you see, the, uh, the masses now are um, wondering about his teaching. This is the first hint that they're not quite understanding what he's talking about. Do the masses get that when it says that they get something's going to happen to them? The masses say, you say the Son of Man must be lifted up. Who is the Son of Man? So do they get it? The multitudes get it that something's going to happen? No, they don't get it because... Um, uh, they seem to understand that he's talking about suffering and death, but their conception of the Messiah is not the suffering Messiah, it's the reigning Messiah who never dies. Okay, so they're confused. Who is this guy? Yeah, what is he doing? yeah the Messiah. There's nothing like that supposed to happen to the Messianic person. Okay, because they're only looking at the reigning side of the coin. They aren't going to flip it over to see the suffering side of the coin. So they're confused. All right, section 191. And we're picking it up on page 22. 22 of your outline. We're on page 181 of your harmony. Section 191. The departure from the unbelieving multitude and Yeshua's response. So this is really John's summary of the Messiah's ministry. Verses 37 through 50 are really a summary of what has gone on. So he begins by summarizing Israel. The summary concerning Israel. And we'll see as we go through this that Israel is characterized by willful 
disobedience. And this is nothing new. For example, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. So in 700 BC, uh, we were uh, in willful disobedience. Isaiah repeats in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan, but not mine, who make an alliance, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin. Doesn't that remind you of the triumphal entry? We're making a proclamation, but we don't have any fruit to back it up. Okay? Alrighty, so Israel is characterized by willful disobedience. It's still true today. And this is brought out in two points. The first point is that most did not believe the signs that Jesus gave to the nation. Uh, John 12, verses 36 through 41. These things Jesus spoke, and he departed and hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this cause they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted, and I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. So most refused to believe the signs. And um, John has completed giving us his seven signs at this point. And remember, of course, Jesus has performed many, many signs for the nation. And they have all been rejected at this point in time. And so the nation is under judgment. The second point he makes is that those who did believe were afraid because of the Pharisees. And this is in verses 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. So again, the profession is false. You know, the fig leaves are false. There's no fruit there because we're hailing him as the Messiah, but we're not believing the signs and we're afraid of the religious leaders, unwilling to take our stand with Yeshua. Yeah, but some of them being starved and how they were beating them too, some of those, get, uh, it seems like the religious leaders had, were wielding a pretty powerful sword. Yeah, the religious leaders were wielding a pretty powerful sword as well. Yeah, yeah, there was a, a lot going on there, a lot of dominance. All right, so Israel is willfully disobedient, but in contrast, Yeshua is willfully obedient. And five points come out, uh, concluding the section for us. First of all, he was sent by the Father in verse 44. And Jesus cried out and said, who, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. So he issues another invitation, and he has obeyed the Father, because the, Obather, the Father sent him, and he went. He came. He was incarnated in human flesh, became totally, uh, fully God and fully man. Secondly, he testified of the Father, so he was obedient there in verse 45. He who beholds me beholds the one who sent me. And so that was part of his mission, to come and testify of the Father. So he's been obedient by coming and being the light. And that's the point of verse 46. I have come as light into the world, and everyone who believes in me, that who, everyone who believes in me may not remain in darkness. So he's obeyed the Father by shining out as the light of the world. And again, verse 46 is that sub-theme of the conflict between light and darkness. Fourthly, here comes that invitation. Acceptance of him will result in salvation. Verse 47. If anyone hears my sayings, and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. So he obeyed his father became, because he came on this mission of salvation. The judgment will come at the second coming. Salvation comes at the first coming. So he obeyed the father 
to go through the experience of death and resurrection. And finally, the fifth point, rejection of him will result in judgment by the Father, verses 48 through 50. He who rejects, rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak of my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandments is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. So again, he's obedient because he's giving the Father's message out to Israel and eventually to the entire world. And so this brings the uh, 11th of Nisan, Monday, the 11th of Nisan, 30 AD, to a close. And so with this summary, the, uh, we come to a close of the first coming ministry of the Messiah in John's mind. So we'll uh, close our lesson right here as well. I've got exactly 8.30, so we'll pick it up next week on section uh, 90, 192 when we come to the withered fig tree and the lesson on faith. So let me go ahead and close in prayer, and, um, and then I'll turn you loose. Father, again we want to thank you for Yeshua, the fact that he was obedient, uh, the Israelite par excellence, in contrast to so many uh, of us in the Jewish family, the Jewish nation, that even today turn our back on him. 99% of us reject his Messiahship. And yet, Lord, the invitation still goes out, and the words of warning still go out, that the King has come, and we need to receive him and trust in him. And Lord, if there's anyone in this room that has not done that, I ask that you work in their heart and uh, bring them to that point where they can make that responsible decision of faith to trust Yeshua. And for those that have had trusted Yeshua, help us to be the light in the world. He's left us here to be salt and light, to uh, be obedient to Him, and to uh, present the, uh, the gospel to all the world, to make disciples of all the world, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. So help us, Lord, to do that in our sphere of influence, whether it be work, whether it be family, whether it be um, those we run into on a plane, or... Uh, our friends, our neighbors, help us to speak the words of eternal life, speak the words of truth that will bring them into the family of God. Help us to be obedient, and we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Alrighty, we'll see you next week.